Yeah, so I think before we uh, got here, we were talking a little bit about the, some of the challenges with data and the fact that, you know, just in the way that some humans are biased, uh, well, all humans are biased, uh, some <laughs> algorithms like. are biased and are written by humans or fundamentally human creation. So we were kind of discussing how that could be, you know, overcome that you can try to engineer out some of those biases and you had some right. really interesting ideas about that. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the challenge with doing work with data for problems that impact people in very critical ways is you have to be conscious of that fact, right? If you're Google and you show a wrong ad to somebody, who cares? Yeah, uh, yeah. They'll move on, they'll, they'll live, but if you get jail sentencing wrong, if you get you know uh, homelessness outcomes or public health or education things wrong, it affects people's lives. And relying on data is great. You have to do it, but at the same time, it can't be a blind reliance. So how do you, you know, we're talking about like how, how do you design algorithms to detect that bias, to audit that bias, to expose it to the, the people making the decisions, and then ideal world try to correct it. But you may not be able to correct it automatically. You might need to bring in an expert who says, here's a decision I'm, I, I'm recommending you take. And then you have a conversation with the computer. Hmm. Say, why do you think that decision is the right one? Oh, because of these different factors about this person, their background, like, yeah, but that looks like that data came from this source. But do you think it's reliable? And the computer chugs and says, yeah, you know what, you're right. That, that there is, that data looks like it's, it's a lot of people from a certain demographic segment that are overrepresented. So let me correct for that. And, and, and so I can imagine that conversation happening in a decision-making capacity hmm. as opposed to a one-shot predict, make a decision, take an action, and move on. Right, uh, right. It's a much more iterative process. Yeah. 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 No, that's really interesting. So uh, speaking of prediction, one thing that uh, sort of surprised a lot of pundits, maybe not everyone, but uh, Donald Trump's election. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, you heard on some reports that he was ignoring all the consultants and just sort of going off the, flying by the seat of his pants. Uh, on the other hand, you'd hear reports about his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, running a really sophisticated data team using some of the same tactics that you used to help mm -hmm. uh, President Obama get elected in 2012. Mm -hmm. So uh, do, you, do you have any insight about sort of what happened? I mean, <laughs> hard to dissect, I'm sure, from the outside in hindsight, right. but um, right. what are some lessons for future campaigns that are trying to use data both for prediction and to you know, turn out the vote? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, you know, full, full disclosure, I have no inside knowledge of either campaign mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't tell you anything what, what Trump did or didn't do. The, the second thing that's interesting is people are making a lot of inferences about what happened. And to be honest, nobody knows what happened yet hmm. because the data, a lot of those things are, are being discussed based on exit polls. And we already know the polling didn't really give us the results we expected. So how are we expecting exit polls? So all the analysis about, you know, uh, whether it's uh, white collar males, whether it's a college, non-college educated uh, males who, who voted and all that is kind of conjecture at this mm. point. Mm. So until individual turnout data comes out, which is going to be pretty soon, then we can start seeing who voted, who didn't vote, what happened. But the other thing is a lot of people start taking this as, you know, failure of, of data. And if anything, it tells you the need to get better data. Mm. So the biggest thing that happened, probably, again, this is not... the. I'm saying things also, you know, I'm kind of making some educated guesses is that the turnout predictions happen to be wrong and they could be wrong in two ways. One is you called people, you asked them whether they were voting or not. They told you something and you made predictions based off of that. Now, they could have lied. <laughs> yeah. uh, historically, they haven't lied. Or you didn't reach a representative sample. So people you called who didn't pick up the phone um, you assume they were going to split kind of evenly because historically those people just don't vote. Mm. If they're not going to answer your questions about voting, they generally don't vote. What's possible this time is that those people did vote. You mm. just weren't able to get to them. And because of that, you didn't have the right data. Um, so if anything, hopefully what we figure out is the value of not just analysis uh, and decision making, but really understanding where your data is, so same as the bias, right? This is the mm. same question is, mm. was there a bias in the data? Absolutely, there was. Should you have spent more time correcting for it? Absolutely, yes. The problem is elections don't happen very often. Mm. Presidential elections don't happen very often. Right. Presidential elections with a candidate like Trump don't happen very often, <laughs> luckily. Um, 
So all those things being such rare events, it's like predicting, you know, things that are not very frequent. So, mm. so I think there is a little bit of data is useful, but you should know when to qualify the decisions and, and have kind of be ready for kind of making in investments and getting better data as, as it, in, in addition to sort of doing the, the analysis and the, and the actions. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And it kind of does tell us with a, a point I've heard you make before, which is that in doing data science, it's just as important to focus on the science aspect of it as it is to focus on the data. Because lots of people can mm -hmm. hack data, they can you know scrape it from various websites and, mm -hmm. and play around with it. But uh, there is a certain science when you're trying to both make predictions and you know judge causal impact. Right. So how do you kind of tease those things apart? Yeah, and that's that's interesting because you've got sort of You've got sort of two worlds right now, or almost like three worlds, trying to do things with data, right? You've got the traditional social science world. Uh, they've used data for decades to mm -hmm. make policy decisions. Um, and then you've got the, the computer science, data science world, who have a lot of methods and tools, but they haven't really been exposed to these problems. So they're kind of mm -hmm. coming in saying, we've got these new tools. We want to have an impact, too but they haven't had the time to build the relationships with the people who have those problems. They've mostly been focused on corporate problems with advertising and search and social networking, but not critical. And then you've got sort of this middle set of people who are, I guess you were saying, you know, data hackers, right? They, yeah. they, they know how to do something with data, but then they don't do it in a principled way and they don't do it to solve a problem. They're kind of just vigilantes where they'll get some <laughs> data from the web, put something up and, and, and that sort of, tricky, right? And the, the ideal thing is to sort of bring them all together, mm. to bring the social science world up to speed on, here are some new methods and tools that can really help you scale to the new the data that's coming up, to the detailed fine-grained data, to methods that are much, much, much more effective at doing certain things that you haven't been doing that well, but then taking the computer science and data science world and saying, look, it's not about prediction. It's about changing behaviors of people. You can predict all you want, Mm. But if somebody doesn't change their behavior, then you're just going to say, see, I watched that. I'm going <laughs> to predict that person's going to get lead poisoning or that person's going to get shot or that person's going to get sentenced. And, and it happened. I was right. Mm. Uh, and so I think there is this coupling of you want to bring in good science to solve the problem, but you also want to understand the problem and have policy. And, and I think that's hap starting to happen now. People from both sides uh, are coming together and the people from the sort of the the middle place are, are, are coming in as well. Right? Hmm. Um, so, so that's really exciting where you're bringing all these people together from governments and that's happening both in universities. Um, so Chicago, we've got a joint computer science policy program. We've got a program like that at Carnegie Mellon. There's a program like that that's going to start over the next year at Georgetown. Oh, great. Um, so creating those people who can bring in those those skills and and move towards having policy and social impact, it's starting to happen. So it's exciting times. Yeah, that's terrific. And I, I have to say, I mean, the fellowship that you run, the Data Science for Social Good, it, it's such a tremendous thing because I, I, I come from a local government background mm -hmm. and most of the challenge actually is getting the data initially. <laughs> yes. uh, and, and that's a, a place where data scientists are pretty well equipped to be able to go in and write the code to access yeah. the systems. But then that's, as you say, only just the beginning. Right. And from there, you have to have a really thoughtful mindset about how you're going to go uh, mm -hmm. about making predictions and ultimately affecting the lives for the better of the people you're trying to help. Um, so you've now done data science in the you know, kind of corporate R&D space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, since it was uh, before it was a buzzword. And, um, you know, in academia, on, a, on the campaign trail, are there lessons that apply broadly across all these uh, different fields? Yeah, data is good. No. <laughs> uh, you should do more with data. I mean, I think, I think the lessons are, are very, very similar. Um, I think the stakes are very different. Mm. Um, so doing it in a corporate R&D space, the stakes are pretty low. Yeah. You can get things wrong and nothing really bad will happen. Mm. You, know, you know, some company will lose some money. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> life goes on. Um, in the political space, it's a very, the, the difference is, again, it's, you have very short time to do anything. You can't really build an infrastructure. You just have to run and you, can, you have to solve 100 problems 80% well, mm, as mm. opposed to solving three problems really well. <laughs> yeah. um, whereas in the policy space, you've got a lo lot of time. Um, 
because these problems are not going to go away. Mm. Um, and, but things move a little slower because there isn't that urgency because you're sort of dealing with perpetual problems and you're dealing with you know slower turnaround time where you don't have a real deadline. It's like we can do better. But I think what's common among them is, as you said, that it, it, it sort of requires one is you it, it, to do these things well. You, it requires a, a a sort of a a mix of people, right? You don't have individuals who can do everything, hmm. and you need expertise from. You need computer scientists. You need statisticians and math people. You need social scientists. You, you sort of need people who understand the problem, and you have to and you have to kind of bring them all together to solve these problems well. Hmm. Um, and bringing these teams together requires organizational buy-in. If, if you're a city, if your mayor isn't bought into this, good luck getting anything done, right? You get yes. the best team underneath. <laughs> That's right. Um, but you need organizational buy-in. You need the data infrastructure in place. You could have, again, the best team, but if they don't collect uh, data historically, if they every time when somebody's address changes, they just overwrite it, um, good luck getting anything done with you know predictions because you have no historical data. Mm. So, so I think there is kind of very, there's sort of prerequisites, which means organizationally data. But then once you have things together, having, and this is, you know, given this venue, there's a lot of stuff around the right metrics and outcomes measurement around social investing and impact investing. Same for working on data science. If you don't have a, a very well-defined metric that you're optimizing for, so having that metric that, that you can optimize for, having uh, people who are not just sitting in a corner doing data, mm. whatever that means, they're right. embedded into the organization, understand their needs so that they can be much more proactive. Um, and then having the capacity and willingness to experiment and test things. Mm. And that's where the science comes in as well a little bit is sometimes people sort of say, I try something out and that's an experiment. <laughs> well, it's not an experiment, just try something out. Mm. You're not going to learn much from trying something out. And so how do you actually, in a lot of examples of experiments gone wrong because people weren't running an experiment, they were just trying stuff out. Pilot. Yeah, um, yeah and that's different. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of um, commonalities across, if you're trying to solve a real problem with data that starts from defining the problem to having the impact, the steps are very similar across, whether you're doing it in industry, whether you're doing it in mm. political campaigns or you're doing it in, in policy, um, and it requires, you know, the right set of people focused on the right metric with the right data and the buy-in of the people who are actually going to take the action, right? Because that action is the thing that's going to change. Sure. And the, the people with the data are not going to be the ones taking the action they're recommending. Hmm. So our job is to sort of make sure that we can formulate the right problem and help people make, sort of make it hard for them to do the wrong thing. <laughs> make, make it as hard as possible so they're just, they just can't do the wrong thing. Um, that's sort of what I feel like that's what's common across all of these things. That makes perfect sense. So um, speaking of you know all these different sectors, the private sector has made some big leaps and bounds recently with you know artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. deep learning neural nets, uh, really amplified predictions and made a lot of software tools a lot more user friendly and, and yeah. useful. Um, I'm wondering if you see broad applications for some of these bleeding edge tools like some of the neural nets and other uh, really deep learning uh, mm -hmm. you know algorithms if those could be applied in the social sector to the same effect i mean in, in, in an abstract way yes because there's nothing unique about the problems i think it's the, now that being said some of some of the reasons where deep learning and, and neural nets are working that well it's not new technology they've been around for a long time all of a mm -hmm. sudden you had faster computers so now you can run them much faster biggest change that happened was that the amount of data that was available. Right? Mm. Um, and so when you have Google Images with you know, zillions of images in there, you can give it all that it can find things that are similar and put them together. Um, same for audio clips. If you've got tons of audio clips that if you're uh, uh, YouTube and you've got audio and video clips, you can you just sort of put it all together. Um, that scale for a lot of things isn't there in in government problems hmm. you've got. And the problems are less, from a data side and analysis side, the problems are less complex. So some of the simpler, like, so if, if Google was trying to figure out, you know, who's gonna click on the next ad, 
that's not a complex enough problem to use deep learning. Mm -hmm. They don't use deep learning for that right. because Makes sense. it doesn't give you the additional benefits. So if you're trying to figure out, you know, how do I uh, predict which which person is at risk of some public health uh, issue or homelessness or recidivism, the challenge is lack of data about these people over time and not that you have all this data about them, you're monitoring them, you have videos and you have audio and you sure. and then you just need a better algorithm. Like that's that's not the bottleneck here. It's really the, the capacity to collect this data and taking action. Um, now that being said, there are opportunities in in some of the places where you do have some of that data, right? So take if if a city is trying to figure out evaluating impact of its policies in different neighborhoods, Today, they're probably, you know, in the most expensive way they'll do it is they'll probably walk around a neighborhood and take notes about the condition of a neighborhood. They've left mm. data from other places, but but now imagine just taking pictures of that neighborhood. Just have a van, this Google, Google, you know, street yeah, view van, yeah. just going and just taking pictures. And now automatically understanding, and you just do it, or uh, things that are more sensors that are collecting more fine grained real time data on air quality, on noise, on you know, people's patterns of movement and transit, that data gets complex. And mm. so I think there are a lot of opportunities when the data is, is complex, take police and body cam footage. Mm. That's again, very complex data. If you're yes, trying sir. to figure out uh, what happened and you're doing it across a lot of body cams, could you build gun detectors into those body cams where, mm. you know, you're not, if, if it's unsure whether there's a gun or not, then it sort of just has, a, has something that's helping now there are practical challenges about, you know, is it a distraction to police officers in the middle of it, or are there other things you could do to make it, you know, more effective? So I think there are opportunities, um, but it's going to take a while to figure out sort of how critical are those problems, and where you have enough data where the problem is complex enough that it warrants the use of some of these methods. Mm. Um, but I think in the in the short term, it's really about. Can we collect better data? Yeah, yeah. And can we take action on the analysis we're doing as opposed to going towards the, the state of the art? Yeah, I, so. I would agree 100%. Um, I've met with now a lot of students who are interested in doing you know, data science for social good and are interested in these social problems. And a lot of them come with a background in these, uh, in the you know very newest algorithms, applying them to very large data sets. Um, and it's sometimes hard to make that transition into the social world where the data is small, mm -hmm. the problems are huge. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any advice for you know, budding data scientists who really want to tackle these big social problems and help make the world a better place? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I've been doing with the last several years is training these, these students who are interested in a social impact, have some of these skills, but, but don't know how to get there. And I think what at least we've learned is one is you're going to have to be willing to invest time into learning about the problems because hmm. we are, are the students and even you know before i was doing this work the, the the typical grad student today in in a tech area can tell you all the problems that facebook's facing google's facing uh twitter's facing because they're consumers of those tools sure so <laughs> they go to facebook oh i wish i was doing this better and so they have hmm. an intuition of what problems are being dealt with and they have often have in their research groups access to their data. They, their advisors often take sabbaticals and go into those places for a year, six months. They get internships there. So there's an ecosystem which allows those companies to benefit from research that's happening mm -hmm. because they're exposed to their problems. Now, you ask a typical grad student about the biggest challenges in education or public health or sustainability, no idea. Uh, hmm. And it's not because they don't care. Of course they care. Right, um, right. Just they, they just have, don't have opportunities. I think first is that they have to invest the time into understanding those problems, and that needs to be mediated. And that's sort of a lot of the work we do. Is like let's let's not just put them together. Hmm. Let's create a structure where they learn about the problem, and they actually try to solve that problem. So I think that's one. The second is that they have to sort of change the mindset from applying the latest the greatest algorithm to solving a problem. Hmm. Which, to be honest, most grad schools are doing a horrible job of teaching people how to solve a problem. Agreed. You give them a toolkit, and right. they just run around applying that toolkit. <laughs> um, and that's one of the biggest sort of surprises to people when they come into the, it's the summer program, Data Science for Social Good. They learn that it's not about, they learn that they've, all, everything they've learned about the, the different algorithms and methods, that's, 
that, that you, they just can't apply it directly. There's all this stuff there to figure out, how do I validate this thing? How do I realistically look at the trade-offs this organization is going to make? How do I trade off between false positives uh, and false negatives? Mm -hmm. It's not it's not given to them. There's no requirement. You have to sort of interact with the government agency and figure out what are your policy goals? Mm. Would you rather miss people or would you rather flag mm. extra people? Mm. Like, oh, I don't know, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. And so equipping them to ask those questions um, and then incorporating the answers back into their analysis and really having a conversation again with, with policy people. I think th there's sort of a lot of, there's a gap between what you learn in the class typically and what it takes to solve a problem. Mm. And so my advice to a lot of people is find somebody who's doing that. Mm. Spend some time there, invest the time, learn how to do it, and then go in into, into the social sector. Because the jumping in right away, I don't think you're equipped to do that right away, so you kind of need a, a soft landing. Yeah, um, yeah. And so find organizations that are doing that, um, spend some time there, learn how to do it, and then, and then go off and, and do more of it. Well, that's perfect so. advice. I wish someone had given that to me in grad school. <laughs> same but, uh, here. Same here. I wish the same thing. Yeah. Well, listen, it's been a real pleasure yeah. chatting with you. Yeah, same here. Thanks so much Thanks. for answering my questions. Thank you.